welcome to Bay Area Psychology. Tonight, we take a look at everyday ethics, ethical dilemmas and moral choices facing us, and the beliefs that guide those choices. In general, we appear to live in a time of ethical flexibility, to say the least. It extends from the corporate Machiavellian ends justifies the means to the moral judgment we pass on our poor, particularly welfare moms at the moment. Simple courtesy, responding to phone messages and RSVPs have all but disappeared in our frantic busyness, indicating an overwhelming ethic of survival. Even the golden rule appears to have converted to do unto others before they do unto you. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Reverend Carol Lundy from the Unity Church in San Jose. She's agreed to offer her perspective on our ethical dilemmas. I want to welcome you uh, to Bay Area Psychology tonight. Thank you for making the time to join us. Thank you, Mary. It's a joy to be here. We were uh, talking a little bit before the show, and you had mentioned um, an interesting point in terms of the origins of the word ethic that I'm wondering if you could share with our viewers tonight. You know, I dearly love words. And so very often I look up the, the root of a word, the Germanic or the Latin root, because being a minister, uh, I've learned that the, the language was, was uh, the domain of the priesthood in ancient times. And so very often the words we speak now have a, have a religious meaning or a spiritual meaning. Mm. And so when you mentioned to me ethics, I was looking it up and it comes from a, a Germanic and a Latin root meaning uh, it's a reflexive to tie back to oneself, to tie back to what is deep within oneself. And so our, our ethics, our, our moral code is something that should tie back to the highest and the best within ourselves. Okay, so ideally um, it is a reflection of um, our own personal and spiritual development. Yes. It should be reflected in our behavior. Yes, it should be reflected in our behavior. Um, the, the moral and ethical codes uh, were created to make a framework in which society could survive. And so it was a survival thing in, in ancient times, and how are we going to survive together as humanity? And so those who created these kind of codes created something that would help us uh, in our behavior not to harm each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's probably the uh, original overwhelming ethic, which mm -hmm. is to not to do harm. Not to do harm. Okay. The Hippocratic Oath. Okay. Yeah. Now, as a minister, you have a certain code yourself. I yes. Imagine. In fact, I have two printed pages, single-spaced. Okay. Uh, there is a code of ethics for unity ministers. And at first, when students look at this, they think, oh, my word. You know, I, and as I read through it, though, I thought, none of these things that are in here are, are things that are, I'm not in alignment with, that isn't already part of how I see myself interacting with humanity. And surely the last thing I want to do is harm because I'm in this profession to, to assist, to help people live their lives the highest and best that they can. What, um, what called you to the ministry, just out of curiosity? Um, it, it happened over a long period of time, uh, but essentially the big bang kind of came at one point when I sat in a New Thought church for the first time and they told me I was not a victim of life, but that my, I created my life and things happened according to my predominant thinking. And that if I wanted to change my life, I should change my thinking. And so as I began to follow these teachings and to change my, my thinking, sure, a lot, sure enough, my life just turned over like a pancake. I mean, I, I'm a different person than I ever was before and I see life so differently. And I know how to create success in my life now, and I'm not just haphazardly stumbling through. Okay, so one of the outcomes of that process for you then was, uh, it sounds like a tremendous personal shift, and with that probably came an ethical shift for you as well in that process. Um, a clear, a clearer ethic. Okay. You know, I always, I always had some kind of ethics within me that I probably picked up from my mother and father, okay. who were wonderful people. Okay. And so I sort of had that as a child, but I, I had not articulated it. Okay. And so I was just kind of following it blindly, and this gave me a way to articulate it, make it a lot clearer in my life, so I have a sense of consciously what I'm doing. Oh, good for you, sort of. Uh, why do I believe what I believe? And being able mm -hmm. to, to say it. 
Um, I was reading a book in preparation for this called Everyday Ethics, and mm -hmm. the author comes uh, mentions nine different sort of moral cliches that are pretty mm -hmm. common for people in terms of, um, since most of us aren't given two pages of ethics to memorize, we have to figure them out as we go. And yes. um, it's true that uh, our childhoods and our early influences do play a big role. Big and our culture has a certain amount of, uh, certain amount of influence as well. So I thought what we could do, sort of as a, as a general outline, is to take a look at some of these cliches right. and see what you think in terms right. of real life, in terms of ministry and people coming to you with dilemmas. Mm -hmm. Let's right. take a look at the first. Uh, what goes around comes around. Actually, uh, the author says, very bad things do happen to good people and vice versa. So what's the payoff? for living ethically. This whole idea that somehow if good things are happening in my life, that means um, I've earned them. And if bad things in my life are happening, somehow I must be being punished for mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's not an uncommon dilemma for you uh, to hear at all. Not uncommon at all. It's, it's what have I done wrong. And um, Unity is a new thought church, and so we, we look at the metaphysical interpretation of things. And it's so easy for people to say, well, if my thinking caused this, then I must be a terrible person. Mm -hmm. And that's a misuse of metaphysics. Uh, metaphysics is, if my thinking caused this, then wow, I can change it. Okay. And it doesn't mean you're a good or a bad person. Very often, people just have a very poor self-image. And in, in the way they talk to themselves about themselves, that, gee, I'm not smart enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not short enough, you know, on and on and on. There's no end to the self-criticism that we become involved in almost unconsciously. We, we just run it automatically. And it's this predominant thinking that draws to us situations that kind of mirror that back to us and say, you really need to change your thinking. You know, we kind of run into a, a situation that, that's hurtful to us, mostly because it's a mirror of how we treat ourselves inside. Okay. And it's not because we're a bad person. Very good people do this to themselves. Okay. And this is what we've been taught by our society, uh, sometimes by uh, the religions of the world, is you're a sinner, mm -hmm. you know, and you always will be, and you need to do this struggle to try to be good, but somehow you'll never make it. Yeah. And and I, instead of talking about original sin, I talk about original blessing. Okay. That you are originally blessed and you can carry on that blessing throughout your life if you become aware that you are a blessing and, and that okay. you're not, you're not this, this ugly sinner. You're a person who doesn't know who you are. Okay, so part of that is, you know, I've also heard it described um, uh, when I read uh, various rabbis on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, the when bad things happen to good people. Yes, or I was reading another uh, book recently called uh, When People Can't Believe mm -hmm. by a different rabbi. And we were, they were writing about this idea of um, looking at uh, there's a function of nature that's morally neutral. Mm -hmm. Things happen. Mm -hmm. And there's that transformative opportunity that comes. Mm -hmm. And so that reminds me of when you're talking about um, how we uh, are seeing things and kind of our belief systems, that how we approach something that's neutral mm -hmm. is going to determine a lot about what happens next. One thing that fascinated me in this, this huge rock slide that yes. happened, and the young woman who crawled out through that and survived, she had been there for prayer and meditation. Huh? And okay. whatever, in my belief, whatever that prayer and meditation consciousness was that she had going was that, that overall consciousness that protected her to get her out of that. Okay. Yeah. So there was, a, there was for her, there was a um, uh, kind of an ethic of the value of life for her. Maybe. Yeah. She was just in that state of mind that is, yeah. that is eternal and um, if, you're t if you want to talk about divine protection or whatever it is, we get ourselves into that, that state of mind and we do not draw to us harm. And here she was under this incredible rock slide and came out unharmed. And I just read that with fascination and I thought, I think I'd have wanted to be in prayer in the middle of that myself. Yes, I think a lot of people would find themselves yes. in prayer in the middle of that. Yeah, there probably aren't too many atheists in a rock slide. That's very true. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next uh, right. cliche that some of us may worry about. Letting conscience be your guide. 
What if do what you think is right translates into bombing a government building in Oklahoma City? This mm. idea of, um, uh, I think in some ways reminds us, me of sort of early training or early feedback, you know, this idea that, well, you should just have to trust what you believe is right. Um, but the author's pointing out that the reality is sometimes what we believe is right for various reasons, you're talking mm -hmm. about maybe even mindset, um, can be skewed. Yes, very much so. And, and I'm sure that, that all of these terrorists believe they are absolutely right. And you'll hear them say, well, you know, I'm called by God. This is a jihad. This is a holy war. And they totally believe this is right. But I go back to uh, no harm. I will do no harm. The fabric of society cannot exist if we do harm. And these people are doing harm. And so even though they have this twisted idea of what may be right or what they're called to do in their minds, they're doing harm. Well, and that brings up sort of um, an uh, ethical benchmark. I mean, let's say, um, how, my, how can I know if my thinking is um, ethically aligned? I mean, what do we, what do we bounce that against mm -hmm. to sort of determine that? Yeah, yeah. And for me, it's to go back within myself, to tie back to the innate goodness that created me and you and everyone, whatever you want to call that, and say, I am here to do no harm. And is what I'm thinking and is what I'm about to do about to cause harm? And is there a way I can avoid that? Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there isn't. Can you give we us get an in example? some real dilemmas um, where someone comes in and they, they point a gun at you and you pick up something to throw at them uh, as a way of defending yourself, restraining the harm that they're about to do to you. And is sometimes I think, well, if I'm going to be alive to do good in the world, I have to also defend myself. And so, you know, and these aren't the things, you don't think all these words when you're in the middle of something oh, well, like sure. that. You just react and respond. Sure. Self-preservation. But once again, it goes back to a survival, mm -hmm. preservation, and do no harm. Well, and also yeah. how you define harm. I mean, I mm -hmm. know in the addiction field, for example, yeah. you know, one of the ways that um, theoretically you might do harm is to not say difficult things. Yes. You know, for yeah. me to not um, confront a situation which will be painful for others mm -hmm. um, is yes. inadvertently um, creating much harm. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to take a quick break and we'll come back. All right. Stay with us. When we return, we'll examine more cliches. Welcome back. When we left, we were talking about the ethic of doing no harm, and that reminds me very much of our next cliché, so I thought we would uh, turn to it and, and discuss it. All's fair in love and war. And uh, Joshua points out that love, like war, involves people at their most vulnerable. That ethical sensitivity is especially important here. Where do you, what do you think?